For at least 3,000 years, cultures across continents have known about our nearby neighbors. To our ancient ancestors, the only wandering wonders, as planets were known back then, were Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Despite this, it wasn't until 1584 that an astronomer named Giordano Bruno published a manifesto putting forth that just like our sun, every star in the sky might host its own system. Quick side note, these supposed stellar settings are not solar systems. Sol is the name of our star specifically. Exoplanets orbiting their own suns are boringly just called planetary systems. From Bruno's first brush with the idea of exoplanets all the way to the 1900s, their existence was stuck as mere speculation. It wasn't until 1992 that researchers confirmed their first exoplanets, having first spotted them in 1988. These are small planets, circling PSR B1257 plus 12, aka PSR 1257 plus 12, also known as PSR J1300 plus 1240, or for me at least, more memorably, Lich. Lich is a pulsar. These husks are what's left behind by some stars instead of a supernova. They are magnificently magnetic and rotate ridiculously quickly. These attributes act as an invisible aiming apparatus as the moving magnetic fields force the star's radiation into a thin beam passing through the poles. When spinning, these beams sweep through space 161 times per second in Lich's case, like a galactic lighthouse. The earliest exoplanets, called Poltergeist, Phobitar, and Draugr, were discovered by timing how often Lich shines its light on us. You see, pulsars pulse impossibly precisely, so even extra small undead themed rocks can cause detectable deviations, lagging our Lich light. The thing is, the vast majority of lordly skylights lack laser-like lashes of light. Most of them are main sequence stars, which are much more like the sun in that they eject energy evenly-ish. So, if we can't time how often we get pelted with pulsonic positrons, how do astrophysicists ascertain the existence of exoplanets orbiting around their stars? Nowadays, we often just see them with our telescopes, but that wasn't the case really until like 2004, and there were plenty of exoplanets found before then. So, where artistic imagery often fails, physics must try to prevail. While there were plenty of mathematical methods, by far the most favored throughout the Friends and Furby era was the radial velocity method. Looking to the lights of the night sky, we see quite a lot of mostly white, but what we see is sadly limited by our eyes biology. Where the stars we see are white, a spectrograph writes as waves. Blue waves have short lengths, meaning they pack more pumps per parsec. Red rays ride relaxed waves. We know that the light from every single star is moving at the same speed, so something else must be happening to change these wavelengths. That thing is called the Doppler effect. When the source is pulled away from us, each additional crest in the wave starts further than the previous one. Conversely, when the star is pulled towards us, each additional wave starts nearer to us than the previous. The faster the star is moving towards us, the higher the frequency, producing a blinding blue. So when the star making the rays is pulled away, her rays stretch thin, but when pulled towards us, they pack tighter in. We can't see this shift ourselves, but what we see on our machine is a tiny wobble in the rays that are recorded, which is why we also call the radial velocity method the wobble method. When we see a wobble from red to blue rhythmically repeat, we can tell a star is moving away and towards us with regularity. In space, this means it's orbiting something. And using quite a lot of physics, we can calculate the mass of that something. If it's smaller than stars ever are, we deem it a planet. So, since we know gravity grows stronger with size and vicinity, what kind of planets would reaching for these wobbles probe out with priority? That's right! Hot Jupiter, baby! Something super big and super close. And boy howdy were there tons of them. Right from the main sequence start with 51 Pegasi B, these giant gaseous globes ringing around their stars popped up in every corner of the cosmos, way more than we would expect. These bad boys swirl around their suns with such insane speeds that they pull their stars with them as they rocket around. On space scales, this speed equates to having a year between 1 and 111 Earth days, which usually means they're skimming closer to their star than Mercury is to ours. 
they're also huge, anywhere from 450 to 15,000 times the size of Earth. Through the 90s, these hot, huge spheres appeared to be everywhere in the universe, but as we can see, their perceived prevalence was a result of how we looked for exoplanets. For 14 years since first sensing poltergeists in 1988, pulsar timing and the wobble method were our only real options for exploring exoplanets, but because pulsars are so ridiculously rare, we basically just worked with wobbling. Because of this, we had way more hot Jupiters in our planet decks than any other kind of exoplanet. This bias had to be dealt with, but it couldn't due to the technical limitations of the time. That's the theme of this lesson. You need to know your biases. Science and culture can only progress if you know to look for what you're not seeing. Data can be a powerful drug, but only if it's cared for competently and explored with curiosity. So sail out, adventure our exoplanets with compassion and curiosity, but always watch the way you wander, for you may well become lost. If you enjoyed this video and want to start your own journey of careful and kind contemplation, consider subscribing.